test is what it's like to. Test! Yeah, I know we're not that soft spoken here, but usually I am. So, all right. Well, it is beyond the 8 o'clock hour, and we're going to go ahead and get started here tonight with another edition of the Austin Salon Poetic. This is the final installment for the year 2013. And if you've been eavesdropping, 2014 promises some very good uh, times ahead. So look forward and uh, move along. All right, so we got a room full of poets tonight. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a few more people coming in as the night goes on. Um, but in the meantime, I guess we're just gonna go ahead and get started with our open mic. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, first up, we will be having the ever-constant Headhunter Tom. That guy, another guy, let's do it. That guy. Let's have a round of applause. There are poets on the moon tonight, and they are watching. And only paranoids can see them. When the moon is full, of course, that's when the tarot people come out, and the astrologers, and the, the people with uh, stars in their eyes, you see. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. It's, this, it's like the soundtrack of a movie that hasn't been made yet. Like, uh, you've all seen Lord of the Rings, and The Hobbit, part one, two, three, what if, what if your life was a movie, and this was the instant sequel? What if there were cameras on every intersection in London? What if people actually filmed the moon landing in the Houston TV studio, directed by Stanley Kubrick, fresh from making 2001? What if all those virtual digital instruments you have are studying to give you cancer? Hold them close to your central cerebellum. They are the ones who will give you direction. When you need to contact someone, don't talk anymore, just text. Instant message, they'll get the message. I'm not saying be mediated, I'm not saying blue pill, red pill. We were talking before about walking down the middle way with a green pill. Some people want to go to the country, they end up in Bastrop. Some people want to get off the grid, they end up in Buddha. But then even Buddha becomes a suburb. Everywhere becomes like Kyle, sedentary and suburb and settle down. Nothing's gonna happen. Just be bright and don't think to think. Because the concept is a great big dream, if you think about it. And just the dreaming itself takes so much time. The time it took for you to get here tonight was the time it took for the birth of your life. I'm talking about the consciousness that rises up when you're not looking. You know they have peripheral vision? You know they say there's only seven chakras, seven virtues in heaven, and definitely seven vices down below. I believe there's more. It's just we lost count. We forgot. Long ago and far away, the stories were told to us in another time and age. When you were Shakespeare and she was Lady Macbeth. And Duncan, Duncan was drunk all the time in Scotland because the weather was so bad, that's all they could do. It was a tragedy. But after all, that's what bodies do, don't they? They just end up on a stage, go on through a stage. But I digress. You see, conversation has largely been demoted into E-I-M and T-E-X-T and T-W-E-T, -E but you know what I mean, E-T, as uh, pining for the invisible fields. Somewhere else is always where it is, but tonight, Headhunters, not Metal and Lace, is where it is. The beginning, of course. The story begins like this. It was the full moon. Full moon brings out the robe of the poets on the lake of silence. They find a lotus. Inside the lotus, there's a thought dream. Inside the thought dream is a door. And next to the door is a window. Through the window, they can see a bird. And the bird is sitting on the branch of a tree. And the tree is the world tree. 
you get yourself. The tree has always been there. It is what is the DNA down your spine, the chakras up divine, right down to the core of the molten core that we laughingly call that earth time. And that's what you can see every time illuminated by the moon outside and the electric lights inside and the neon of your eyes and the little screen that tells us we are dreaming all of this. Someone reaches out across the electric universe, taps us on the, on the IM, says, we are, and you say, I am, I am instant message. The time it takes to get here is the time it takes for the story to reach your ears. Inside these oracles, they're still believing that all things that ever happened before this were only dreaming. So subterranean, underneath the core of all, the details, the feathers on the bird of flight, stroking the tail of the bird of night, way out there with the full moon's eye, watching everyone. There are poets on the moon tonight, and they are hunting sounds and turning them into silences. Thank you, Tom. That was delightful. <laughs> Much appreciated. All right, cool. Next up, we got to the mic, yeah. Scott V. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sit down for too long now. <laughs> All right, lady and uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause, please, yeah. for Scott V. Yeah. Yeah. outside today for the first time yet I wrote the synopsis before it happened for the show that is and it went something like this it went tonight should be a very interesting night because not only is it full moon out in the holiday season but this Saturday it's also winter solstice oh, yeah. So tonight, let's let it all hang out and do nothing but nothing and make stuff up and go around and around and find the place between the place, which as I just thought of as I drove here, the best part of the Michelangelo Sistine Chapel has nothing to do with Adam or God. It has to do with the fact that between those two very special fingers, there's a space. And it'd be very easy to think that your brain is my brain and my brain is your brain, and out between it is just a wide open sea. But the only way for us to have any real fun is to believe that. There is some place to go. There is some place for that sound to travel. And I can't say where the fingers are falling apart or they're just about to touch. 
Thank you, Scott. Yes, I say we all had a hangout tonight, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Can you feel the energy now? Woo! <laughs> that moon's uh, gravity pull on you. I saw you there. All right, cool. So, next up, to the mic. Returning to our stage after some time. With much welcome, Vaselina Orlova. Yeah! Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and to be in Austin. Yeah. Back to Austin. Yeah. Yes. Very glad yeah. I never ceased to write in English during my stay in Moscow, which is, I think, the first time that I was not inundated by Russian there. So this poem is called Glad. When I'm dead, I could do whatever I like. I could dance, I could fly. I could walk through walls. I could see everything. I could say anything. I could do anything. Since I'm dead, I could do and do whatever I feel like doing. And on my premature grave in the galaxy, far, far away, the mottled shadow of a summer birch flutters, and above the forgotten grave, an invisible bird emits a light <coughs> restraint, never-ending complaint, like a very, very thin flute. I am glad I am dead, I am glad. And how could you not be glad? If the only way to be alive, to be brave, is to be dead, my friend, to be dead. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Woo! Bring it. Bring it. Thank you. And um, this is called fish. <laughs> this fish is absolutely unselfish. The cold blooded and red finned fish. It travels via Aerobus for fear of Carus the diligence. Her dear aunt and her brave uncle suffered the violent disease of unrestrained seasickness but perished in the bank of dirigible, a wondrous aerial ship. When the fish drinks its evening tea and stares in the air in an earthly spleen, it sees its cold sisters and red-finned ancestry, aloof and translucent, detached and distant, drifting for several minutes aloft, as clear as it sees you or me. Woo! Yeah, fish, fish, fish. And the one that I read recently in Full English Poetry Cafe. It's called Dragon. A bewildered emperor stands in front of the cage with a dragon and decides to implement the rigorous restrictions, exterminate all the prevarications in the laws for which partly the party was responsible and partly the predecessor. Dragons should be forbidden from now on, and beautiful creatures such as unicorns, porcupines, domestic fishes and animals, including flamingos and those who wear the golden leashes with medals, not to mention the chirping circle of monkeys, scarabs and grackles, and also the pride of chameleons, one commoner than the other, gathered on a shining golden plate, and things like that. That is to say, innocuous, pleasant to an eye, as well as having diagonal stripes or adamantine gaze, or both, are mercifully now wholeheartedly approved. Yeah. 
Thanks. Very nice, Vaseline. I thank you very much for that. Yeah. You're very welcome. All right, I brought um, several books that I actually publish because I was I'm going to be reading some poetry that is not mine. So, oh, okay. yeah, how novel, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read um, a couple, a few poems uh, by a poet named Douglas G. Campbell. And it comes from a publication called Nothing, No One, Nowhere, which is a type of periodical that I was putting out that features poetry and uh, short fiction and photography and art and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, and, um, of course, I, I'm, I edit it, so I kind of choose what goes in. All right, Douglas G. Campbell. This is his poem called Andy Warhol Doesn't Live Here Anymore. You got more than your share with your brash multi-paneled prints, Campbell's suit cans and Brillo boxes rudely grabbing our eyes, trying to pull them from our startled sockets. The factory, its wild art making, parties with crowds of crazies is legendary, like your endless movies that no doubt put your bored persona into a deep and coma-like sleep. The failed murder attempt made us sympathetic momentarily, then you shocked us all by dying unexpectedly on the operating table, though long after your 15 minutes of fame had already elapsed. No doubt God enjoyed your antics. You are still beloved. Wild hair, bland oral eccentricity, and all. Yeah. yeah. This is called Carnival. We have become wizards of subterfuge hiding the mirrored faces we see beneath makeup and lies. We color our hair, polish our teeth, change the color of our eyes, retouch photographs, digi digitally enhance our images so others will not think we age, grow weary, or fall ill. Hmm. Death. We fear you more than ever now, and we live so long. We deny the very bones within us as we pump iron, flatten our abs, power walk our way backwards toward birth. We gorge on vitamins and ginseng, stretch our skin taut with the aid of a surgeon's scalpel so others will not glimpse our battered and fragile egos. Instead of faces, we wear masks that no soul can penetrate, not even our own. Our lips move, oozing pleasantries, our mouths open and close all day long while our hearts are locked, buried deep within vaults beneath our pretense of youth. We squander our lives, we deface ourselves, and we, as we run the race with death. What vanity! Embrace your wrinkled exteriors, for they are your salvation in this nation of smooth talkers. They are a testimony bearing witness to the truth. This is a line of cut with arrowroot balsam. <laughs> Stark white flowers stretch petals into an inky black, spreading themselves across mold-made paper with deckled edges, evidencing a tactile personality. Claw-like sepals, curling leaves, and bits of stem emerge into view as white and black explanations of figure and ground present clarifying suggestions about light and space. After the lengthy process of transferring images to linoleum have taken, has taken, its, taken place outside our scope of observation, and the sharp gouge has excavated an array of small bit pits and troughs, something visual has been formed, printed, matted, and framed, an unfurling of a person unseen and seen. That's that one. And this is the last one I shall read from him. Uh, I could not tell you more about this poet, Douglas G. Campbell, at this time. However, if you'd like to know more, you can visit the nothingknowandknower.com website, and it has his uh, bio work on there. This one's called Toxic Tidings. When this particular high tide surged onto the beaches just below those impressive mansions built by the rich beside the sea, a grand and glorious ocean view with picture postcard sunsets, it brought all of Japan with it, 
futons, tatimas, uh -huh. Toyotas, Hondas, large wooden roof beams, plastic bottles, shopping bags, containers, bloated corpses, unrec unrecognizable and undecipherable, sludge. One large raft of refuse, all with this gorge ingested by a swelling ocean attempting to purge itself of this foul, reeking, and lethal slurry it had borne for too many seasons. Yeah. Thank you. And that was Douglas G. Campbell. Ah. Nothing, no one, nowhere. Look him up. Okay, cool. All right. We now have our fifth entertainer for the night. Are you ready, Julian? So ready. Uh, it, it seems like he is. He has many technical details to fulfill. Oh, hey, it's me. <laughs> uh, you're currently helping me determine the correct oh, angle here. Yes, so, okay. I'm yeah, his. so yeah, that works. Okay, I've got the fucking, okay. Okay, it's that got shit's fucking where it ought to be. It's where it ought to be. Okay, Julian Walden, everybody. Okay, yeah, a little. I think that's the best I can get. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I need to be able to see what I'm reading because this is brand new. And the whole point of this in the first place, well, I was given an incredibly strange and beautiful gift lately, as everyone here I already said and bragged about repeatedly. Yeah. I own a square foot of Scotland, which grants me a title. And the amazing lady that got me this title got herself a matching one, which seems to me just about the sweetest <laughs> gesture I could fucking think of. And uh, I don't know, she leaves me speechless a lot of the time, but that'll last long. <laughs> then I figure out what to say, because I try to find words as beautiful as the presence of this Distant woman in my life, 4,820 miles don't seem like all that much. Nope, try walking it. Thanks to that little window on Facebook. A little tiny window right there in the lower right corner has made such a beautiful connection. And this is all for her anyway. Because the only gift I had in response today, which she gave me the key to, was a song. Hey, you know, you've got to fucking appreciate any woman who addresses you as my lord Texas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite nickname I think I've ever gotten. <clears throat> See, it's a, this gift, this lordship, as it were, it's both something a hippie can easily approve of in that it's a co-op of sorts. The, these gifts, the proceeds of these gifts give... Uh, you know, care to the land and castle. They got lots of old castle just lying around over there needing upkeep, you know. So it qualifies as a co-op, which is a very hippie sort of thing. And it's also a title, which is a snob thing. It allows me to be a snob and a hippie at the same time, which I can't help doing anyway. So that works. <laughs> I'm just kind of freaked out by the whole thing, but in a very beautiful way. I mean, in America, you know, we don't have any old castles lying around. No. If you see a McDonald's that goes as far back as the fucking 70s, that looks like a relic. Like, oh my god, look at that ancient McDonald's, man. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Uh, so I can see the words. This is just called Summerland. One moment, further technical issues. What did I just do? These mice don't always behave themselves. Ah, there we go. And there we are. You came into the twilight of my days. And as far as I can say, I came near it. Until
to you resurrected me have you killed the dread disease the bleeding my spirit so far so many fucking miles and yet love all the while I can hear you and I know we won't get any peace this grief won't be released until I'm near you honey take that plane then take my hand and blossom in the light of the summer land. You're coming from a world that's gray, where colors have been fading for ages to a world that's sweet and bright red and blue and white yours and rages who will raise the stakes and take a stand and make our souls demand my sweet treasure and it's no secret I'm inclined to bend in all my mind to your pleasure like a rose unfold in the heat expand my darling we will thrive in the summer land and so, from a heather, oh baby, fly 5,000 fucking miles Into new spaces Who will shine in gold and silver flash When you at fucking last give Austin your grace I will heal our souls and live so grand in the laughter, light, and love of the summer land. For you, my English, I love you. Very well, Julian. Thank you very much for sharing that song of the heart with us. Oh boy, I gotta send it. <laughs> All right, cool beans. All right. It's age of miracle and wonders, my God. Yes, it sure is. And here comes another cool miracle song. of wonders. Headhunter Tom. Yay! <laughs> Accompanied by Scott. Uh, we're celebrating the solstice at the Full English Cafe, uh, Julian, in this Saturday night. Okay. And the second anniversary of Omaha. Second anniversary of what? Omaha. Okay, right. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Also, I, I'm reminded of the quote that Alice said to Shadrach um, when she came from England. Get me off this fucking island. <laughs> so, the first poem will be um, mission, from a dyslexic... Birmingham poet that I met. Um, I was Birmingham is the second biggest population centre of uh, of Angleland, and uh, I've been to London, and they they just have pubs where little poets talk to each other's shadows, and uh, they had a place called the Hard Edge Club, where all these lawyers and accountants came down and pretended to be criminals. Uh, you know, oh, what you doing, Bob? Oh, I just killed someone. Yeah, okay, sure. 
and they paid their parking fees. But um, Benjamin has dyslexic, he can't write, so he has to make things up. And he's, uh, of course, of West Indian Patwa persuasion. So it's just talking turkeys by Benjamin Zephaniah Birmingham. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas, because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool, turkeys are wicked, and every turkey has a mum. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas, don't eat it, keep it alive. It could be your mate and not on your plate, say, yo turkey, I'm on your side. I've got lots of friends who are turkeys, and all of them fear Christmas time. They want to enjoy it. They say humans destroyed it. The humans are out of their mind. Yeah, I've got lots of friends who are turkeys. They all have a right to a life. Not to be caged up, genetically made up by any farmer and his organic wife. Turkeys just want to play reggae. Turkeys just want to hip hop. Can you imagine a nice young turkey saying, Oh, I cannot wait for the chop. Turkeys like getting presents. They want to watch Christmas TV. Turkeys have brains and turkeys feel pain in many ways like you and like me. So be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Invite them indoors for some greens. Let them eat cake and let them partake in a plate of organic brown beans. Be nice to your turkey this Christmas and spare them the cut of the knife. Join Turkey United and they'll be delighted and you'll make new friends for life. Yo, baby, love your turkey. Benjamin Zephaniah. Now, in, in Sheffield, uh, where they used to make knives, there's a wonderful poet called Matt Black. Matt Black has just recently left as a community arts officer and he's starting to make his own art and his own poetry. So this is one, May the Fuddle Be With You by Matt Black of Sheffield. Along paths, along fields, through these last days and puddles, wear big smiles and scarves and head off to fuddles. From swaddling coat to gloss of leave the old year untroubled. Raise your glasses, share your stories, and let's all get fuddled. Let's get fuddled, 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 truly fuddled. Now dark days are here and the weeks are a muddle. Call on friends, have a laugh, may your hearts fill the fuddle. In bars, offices, homes, forget bills, dentists and struggle. Bring good toppies and vimto and together we will fuddle. Let's get fuddled. Fuddle, 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 let's get fuddled, fuddle, fuddle, let's get fuddled, fuddle, fuddle, let's get fuddled. Drop by for an hour, say hi, have a quick huddle. You know, as always, time for a new fuddle. Oh yeah, baby, time's a thief and now always a great time for a fuddle. From Boxton to Bolsova, where eh, your roads have wobbled, lift your glasses, eat some cake and get happily fuddled. Hey, babes. So there's a little touch of English for you. Yay. This is a mine. Shadow time. Shadow time. And the light dims darker. Cold comes in, night is the hunter. Beneath blankets we huddle, out waiting winter. Seasons define us, chilled our reminders. Once we were cave and spear and fire. Now we are warm, artificially added. Outside, our homeless shudder. All that is war will fall in due time. We burn into light, we spark fire. Cold winds edge skin, slip unto shadowing. Darkness our shadow, dream into tomorrow. Bravely we stage lights to hold darkness at bay. Nights are now longer than our dying days. Trees that were green now bare bone decay. We are the seasons. We change this way. Yes. Woo-hoo. This time I'm keeping Scott on stage. <laughs> He's trapped on stage. <laughs> stage. He's Thank you, Tom. Pleasure. It, 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 no, it was our pleasure. I, and mine too. Oh, well, I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Let's give it up for Scott. Hey, Scott. What am I now? Uh, she was. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something with the nothing, and the guitar is the something, and it's hard to do something with the something because then you got a something between the something, and you get to stop putting your finger on it. So now I want to do something with the nothing. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, nothing to worry about. When when I was when I was about must have been 21. I 
spent some time at West Oaks in, uh, in uh, Houston. And West Oaks, for those who don't know it, is a mental institute. And I was there twice. And I believe this was on my second trip there in 1991. If you will, visualize a psychiatric ward with about eight patients in the psychiatric ward having their counseling session. So we're all sitting around, we're talking, and I picked something up, I forgot what it was. It may have been something so insignificant as something for my nose, but I picked it up and I rolled it around into a little ball. I rolled it into a tiny little ball. And the girl next to me asked if I could, if she could have it. And I thought, okay, you can have it. And I very graciously, because I still hadn't started the path to recovery, I was still sort of disconnected, one might say. I graciously put it in her palm, thinking I was giving her myself in the palm of her hand. So I set myself in the palm of her hand, and she took it and put it in her mouth. Mind you, the psychiatrist in charge of this event was not very happy about this and got very frustrated with her. Which brings me to the point of this story. If there is, and I'm pretty convinced, or at least I should say, sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not, and when I'm right in the middle of things like now, I'm pretty convinced there is, there are powers at work far beyond myself, called y'all. These powers called y'all affect things called me, and thus things can happen. Yet, if one extends beyond y'all to the powers beyond y'all, to the powers beyond them, to the other thing, which makes it rain, makes this person coming off the street into the bar, nope, passing up, so you didn't do that. Or makes earthquakes and tornadoes and storms and cars wreck for no apparent accident except somebody took their eye off the road, but nobody's actually sure why he took their eye off the road. That force sleeps soundly. Sleeps so soundly that there is no awakening it whatsoever. This has always been the case. And this always will be the case. Yet the humans who walk about this planet do know wakefulness. They know wakefulness and they know sleep and they know life and death. So what do we do with the sleeping God? We go about our merry business doing as best we can to provide a little bit of hope, a little bit of cherishment, a little bit of attention, a bit of you, and be thankful for it. Thank you. Woo! Yay! Thank you, Scott. I always enjoy when you share the thoughts inside your head. <laughs> That's a good thing, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Vaselina, will you be joining us again? Awesome. All right. Round of applause for Vaselina. I just thought uh, I should I should I should read you one small Russian poem. It's called Глаза, which means eyes. Я снова видела, как небо сворачивается трубой. И фабрика по ветру стелит свой пышный лисий хвост трубой. И в отражении капота повернута вниз головой. Золотой карась на небе светит и оборачивается вспять. Не красть так страшно и ужасно свои монгольские глаза. You didn't expect that, right? <laughs> well. And this, the translation is very difficult, Michael, you know. Um, I actually do not translate my texts because it's strange to write twice the same piece. I think someone else should translate it or no one should translate it. 
So this poem is called Thoughts. I drink the noise that flows down the street and pours in thoughts into the open window. Its liquid density makes the carpet wet and blows off the lights. A fading out siren starts its cry and stops abruptly. The oriental pillow on the floor looks a bit out of place. But on the second thought fits very well. And I want to hear some people reading the text by others. And I want to read you the, the thing that you surely all know. It is called, I would read only excerpt from that, The Love Song of Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Really charming piece. I just love it. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient that arrives upon the table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Or do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its bank the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin. My neck tea rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions that, sh that a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a father room. So how should I presume? Thank you. And thanks, T.S. Eliot, amazing poet. Oh, yes. And Nazi. Nazi? Well, we love him not about that, Oh, yeah. We won't think of Eliot as a Nazi. <laughs> Oh, if you're a good enough poet, I don't care. <laughs> hey, do it. Here's your pan, baby. Here's oh, your yeah, pan. Okay. Really mm -hmm. That was awesome. Thank you, Rosalina. Thank you. What yeah. a treat. We got some Elliot. Yeah. Tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nominations. Yeah. Nominations. Yeah. 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 It's, I know paper's becoming an extinct uh, object. Or sort of. like poetry. <laughs> poetry is long extinct. Yeah, true. Okay. 
It's just us dinosaurs in here. Yeah. This is called justice insurance. What are we to do when the actions of one affect the meaning of all? Yeah. There is good reason the people were angered by a senator from Texas. We should have allowed the leeching monster to crumble, but we were afraid of the bite. Our blood is pure, our blood is clean, our blood is full of what we truly mean, our blood that could purify the satanic barnacle attacking the hull, infecting the vessel with dis-ease. We've staved off an order illegitimately issued, as no such insight was provided by the representatives, to even read the text of a magnum opus of direct tax, rendered to the friends insured by the issuance of law. Thousands of pages long, we have to pass it in order to find out what's in it, cries the whore of the chamber upon her Baphomet throne. Why stop it? Its very existence lends to its self-destruction. Instead, the government closes shop, unemploying thousands while spending thousands to secure the nation's monuments and parks against families, tourists, and veterans seeking refuge in the natural wonders and the patriotic reminders that call this land home. None of this would have happened if we just let a law that's passed exist. Still, there is the moral stance against the fraud and faux morality sequestered in the writing of this bill. Qui bono, those who wrote this law? Whose stock soared in mere hours of its passage? Qui bono, those fined and charged for not following the letter of an invalid law? And now those of good intent feel empowered to smash the opposition. They come at us with sticks and stones because they've surrendered their firearms. Mm -hmm. The sheen of indignation righteous in their eyes, the view up their nose cavernous, and I am left to wonder what I am to do next as my views closely reflect the opposition. Refined as they are in the aspiring unity that will release us from the change of the change of the Machiavellian and sever the chains of the consumer's materialist coin. The end. This one's called Lying on Proust's Grave. Surely all the boundaries are being broken, but I would be frowned on if I openly disclosed some of the secrets of my life. The tired new writer has used this angle before, gathering responses from the casual encounter ads on Craigslist. Wow. But I've got a secular job and must remain anonymous. The business world does do well when leaders lead double lives, poet or porn star. But I assure you anyone on a hookup site and homosexual most probably is sleeping with random people, even if not from that particular hookup site. Of all the profound things, haven't you learned anything from Cocteau, or Rimbaud, or Burroughs, or Genet? Of course, we don't need to limit this discourse to artists of that spectrum. Some of the best literature is based on real life, after all. The percentages vary. What I found, though, was the voice. Only a sexy child of poetry like you could get away with such a thing in this day and age while flagrantly touting a cliched hero across the black and white landscape of further jaded ideals. But they've been waiting for you. I may have seen hundreds of lost poet boys relaying a, in a coy, sexy pretext, highly versed and playfully lecherous, more than enough, but just enough to want more. This spot in history has been reserved for you. Already so elated in a brash and rebellious manner, we bow down to you and your black tidy whities face down, ass up. You were born to get away with this, and you shall, because you are blessed in all life forms. And when I meet you face to face, the eyes exchange, the swollen glances like universes passing again and again. Whoa, yeah, yeah. Yay.
This is poetic fitting room. I have to speak like you. We all sound the same. It's okay. The long gazing tangent is better. Off the top of the head is organic. There is no need to count syllables or find some type of cadence. We are familiar with all that we, we are familiar with all that anyway. Now we must be real and bear our souls because the critics are watching without meaning to be critics. We all have our own opinions, tunnel vision, liveliness, light. We follow predestined paths into some useless rant of transcendental natures and are carried away and overboard with a pink submarine and the yellow boarding captain waving howdy do and a rah poo poo and do you even know what you're doing here? Pointless. We find the cause has meaning, but the meaning eludes us as it always has. In every incarnation our soul energy may take, we are constantly searching until we have found the answer. And then we do not see each other anymore, for we are gone, because we know and can return home to the source from whence we came. But until then, learn and learn and learn, ignorant until we finally get it. We stand here under spotlight before peer and friend and teacher. And we bear our souls at all hours of the night, at all hours of the day. A cup of coffee will do, and then we begin to begin. We can find home inside of home. We can find soul inside a fold of time. There are no indignities suffered in the plight of the soul. Share it, know it. Love it. Be it. I'm just going to do two more. This is Industry Wish. Grassy hills, lush green, smoke on the horizon. All parties end. To what extent the deepened voice croon in the distant diamond picking straight from heaven's tree the roots ground deep in our hearts. Then there is only the ghostly presence of the past and the recognition of old friends and long lost lovers who all come knocking on the door. Influx like light through opened curtains and railway carts clacking along. Where is the gathering of poets? Where is the gathering of soul keepers? Does the mythology fade away with necessary regurgitations? The established educators on the hill have stifled the souls of the artists. The schemes of crafty men have turned art into a devil's game. Now the grassy hill, surrounded by moody clouds, is waiting for the sun to show its face on the green. It is waiting for that magic orb to chase away the rain man who creates sport at the ruin of the gifted. Thrumming, re thrumming resonance sparkles against the gray. The promise of light in darkened places is worth the cost of the ride. The exposing eyes that cast the voice of truth ring free. And this is the last one I'm going to read. This poem is entitled, My Last Poem. This cold and wintry day seems like a good day to take my poetry to the grave. The meaning and point is lost to me among the fads and all its lit trends. Why not turn to prose in this age of confessionalism and dried out devices? Stripped down for conciseness or typical conversation. Nobody wants to hear any more the distant call of sacredness one must strain to recognize or the hidden treasures buried deep in metaphor. Symbolism is dead, replaced by common word wit, contemporary married extemporaneous. These days you're either a serious academic or a rebellious slammer, all lost to the great aesthetic of the thinkers and the dreamers of gone generations. Thank you. All right. Julian walked out the door. He did. And he's next up on the list. Hey, he's, he's smoking. Julian! Yes, uh, okay, what? <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be. Would you like to close out the night, sir? Um, with some random bullshit, why uh, not? Well, hey, why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Last up tonight on stage, Julian Walden. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you for coming in. Wonderful. You know, it's a hell of a distance to go in barely over a year between an absolute center of your life and loved one who tends to address you primarily as faggot or skirt boy and one that chooses to address you as my lord Texas. I'm pretty sure after dealing with the prior, I completely deserve the latter. I don't know quite how we're going to manage it. One thing I realize as I'm on the verge of having a band anyway, I've got all the people lined up. I worry about how much the guitarist drinks and consider the source of that worry. You know, that's like Keith worrying like, Jesus, does he do too much heroin? You know, luckily the guitarist does not do heroin, but he does drink hard liquor. I normally don't, and right now I drink less for reasons I should not go into. People ask me quite often why I don't choose to write the, just write the truth, because reality has enough like fucked up plots in it that I could get acres of new material. And the reason I don't write the truth is because I realize quite how many people would be completely fucking incriminated if I did. And I don't want that. I have no reason to incriminate any of those people. It's like Bon Scott said in an ACDC song from around 1975-76. Ain't no fun waiting around to be a millionaire. He opens it with, the following is a true story. Only the names have been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna write the flat out truth anyway, because nobody would ever fucking believe it. Never mind the incrimination and trying to come up with new names for have several dozen fucking people. That's just too damn complicated. I don't know. <laughs> I feel rather, rather continually blessed by the people I'm surrounded by. I may have had a lot of things to bitch about over the years, but my current life isn't one of them. I've very, very, very carefully surrounded myself with the correct people. I cultivated Facebook slowly and carefully. People have to have fucking references. No porn vampires. Those are what destroyed my space, really. It was the porn vampires and the bands you never saw nor heard of nor anything. They were just so desperate to find fans. Please like me on my space. This does not reek of desperation, yeah? yeah? But here we are. It was another beautiful day in Austin, Texas, goddammit. Yeah. What can you really bitch about? Woo! Uh. <laughs> And so ends another edition of the Austin Salon Poetic. I have been your host, Michael. These have been the great poets who've been with us tonight. That has been the great sound man, and that has been the great bartender. Join us again next year. January 6th should be the Monday. And we will be moving it to every week here at Headhunters Metal and Lace. Shindig, Madrigger thing. So join us, um, Vaselina. Thank you so much. We appreciate. It. We'll see you in January. Alrighty, cool beans. All right, so come out and see us. Tell your friends. Uh, come get drunk and laugh with us if you want. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, be here or whatever, and uh, we'll see y'all next time.